Welcome to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm speaking to you from New York City on this, the 30th day of April 2019. And uh, I do want to thank you for listening to this show, making it one of the more popular shows in the Voice America Business Channel. And I also want to invite you to keep your questions and comments coming along to questions for Taylor at gmail.com. Questions at number four, Taylor at gmail.com. And we do want to thank our sponsors because without them, there would be no show. They make this economically viable. Miramont Resources, Great Bear Resources, Klondike Gold, Novo Resources, RN Resources, and Strike Point Gold. I've titled today's show, How Can We Thrive, or at least Survive, Against ZERP and NERP, that is Zero Interest Rate Policy and Negative Interest Rate Policy. David McElvaney, Chen Lin, and Michael Oliver are my guests this week. Poor souls who become addicted to drugs or alcohol most often find the immediate pain of withdrawal far too great to discontinue their pathological behavior. To avoid immediate pain, they continue the behavior that inevitably brings death their way. Likewise, central bankers continue their easy money addiction in the same in their attempts to defy the laws of nature by suppressing interest rates to zero or below. So far, these Keynesians, so-called solutions, have avoided prolonged poverty, at least in the Anglo-American empire. But at the same time, that has ensured the death of capitalism, which in turn ensures object poverty for the Anglo-American empire, its people, along with a dreadful nihilism and a hellish existence on earth. We can take that as a given. If socialism, and that's what Keynesian economic monetary policy is, uh, it will end in it will end badly. The recent interest rate pivot of uh, the Powell Fed in response to a plunging stock market at the end of 2018 shows the Fed has no courage to allow interest rates to rise to restore price discovery of capital. And without price discovery of capital, I would argue capitalism will cease to exist. Given the almost certainty of zero and negative interest rates, at least short-term rates in the future. How can we best respond for wealth protection? And we'll seek answers to those questions from all three of our guests today, uh, but uh, with most of the heavy lifting coming from David McElvaney in the second half of today's show. After our first commercial break, Chen Lin will be with me to pass along some of his top picks in the gold energy, uh, gold and energy space, and time permitting also, uh, he has a biotech stock he'd like to share with you. We'll see if we have the time. Uh, but right now, at least we have Michael Oliver with us once again to help us sort things out. Thanks for joining me, Michael. Hi, Jay. Good to be back. It's uh, always good to have you here, and we're so thankful you're here almost every week when you're able to. So, uh, Michael, you, you you just heard me talk a little bit about interest rates. It seems as though the Fed and indeed central banks around the world have painted themselves into a corner whereby in order to avoid pain of an economic depression, they have no choice but to but to um, you know, create more of the same pathology that's gotten us into the trouble in the first place. If supply of money increases, its price interest rates that is, should decrease. Lots of people are thinking that the Fed is still very much in control of things and other central banks. After all, they've bailed us out of one disaster after another, it seems. Uh, and they, they sort of think that interest rates can be low and can stay low and can even be negative without repercussions. How are you seeing and what is your work telling you now about interest rates? In particular, I know the longer end of the yield curve, which you believe the central banks have less control of. Yeah, the, uh, we look at the T-bond futures primarily, but the, also the 10-year uh, bonds around the globe, uh, Japanese, German, and ours. But uh, we had a view uh, back in 2016 that rates would rise. And sure enough, our T-bond market did drop very sharply. Yields went up a lot. Uh, 10-year also dropped sharply. Uh, but then um, late last year, December specifically, uh, we called a low in the T-bonds down in the 140 area on the T-bond futures. Expecting to see it in the, in the low 150s on the rally, we finally got that rally up into the low 150s a month or so ago. And then bonds relapsed back down into the mid-140 area, right now the 147. So we're only about three points off the recent high. So that rally, t- to some extent, was, you could credit it to Powell, but uh, it, it was more a response to the panic in the stock market, the flight to quality. So once the, the panic in the stock market abated in the bonds, obviously the flight to quality ended and you had a pullback in bonds, uh, rise in yields. The question is, where, where are T-bonds going 
big time now. We mm-hmm. still think yields are going higher ultimately, but we're in a, a technical mix here where it looks like the T-bonds are still positioned to enjoy another stock market sell-off, uh, which could buoy them back up again, meaning drop yields a, a bit more. Um, and so we're sort of on the fence here in that regard, but I, I, I'm sort of biased that uh, the, the, the stock market is about at its next high. Uh, we need to at least see 29.50 on the S&P, which so far they've avoided astutely, but I think they'll see it. Uh, and then if we drop from anything 29.50 or higher on the S&P, we drop from there in the next month, which I think we're going to do. Uh, that could put in place the final third high of the S&P since January of last year. You know, it's sort of a widening top pattern. Uh, we don't trust the sustainability of the upside, period, in the U.S. stock market. We do trust it in China and emerging markets, but not here. Uh, if that happens again, obviously what the Fed is going to be forced to do something, not just not cut rates, but cut rates. And it, there's even talk of it right now in the financial markets that maybe mm-hmm. they're going to have a 50 basis point cut coming up, which would sort of put Powell in line intellectually and action-wise with the ECB and the BOJ, which are still committed to maintaining low rates, ridiculously low rates. And so the Fed, by cutting rates again, which is uh, certainly a potential if we see the stock market wobble, and I suspect we're going to see that. So now what would that do to a lot of other markets? Well, Mm -hmm. right now the dollar has been incrementally trying to go up ever since the August high of last year. Dollar index reached up to the price level of 97, which is well below the the bull market peak at 103.50 back in 2016, but still a rally high. In that nine months since then, it's inched a new high about every other month above that 97 price level. The other day it was 98.33. Now all of a sudden today we're back 97.50. <laughs> we're a little 50 cents higher, 50 basis points higher mm-hmm. than the dollar index was in August of last year. So nothing mm-hmm. has been going on there. But if the Fed cuts rates, I'll make you bet the dollar responds to that downside. Mm-hmm. And I think the recent drop in the dollar was somewhat in anticipation of that. Uh, because they're not getting their inflation numbers they want. You know, they want that 2% number, and they're not getting it. So it's a good excuse to go out and let's, you know, let's try to pump it up again. And mm-hmm. if you wobble the stock market, I'll bet they do. I'll bet they cut rates. Now, mm-hmm. that also, I think, would help gold. Uh, gold so far has done quite well. Uh, it's rallied uh, $200 off of its, let's see, eleven sixty twelve dollars $180 off August low of last year without any assistance from a weak dollar. Uh-huh. In fact, it's defied the firm tone of the dollar, which is at best defined as firm. Uh, gold has defied that and, and gained a lot of ground. Uh, and, you know, last Tuesday, for example, in gold, uh, despite the dollar pushing it highs, we put out a report, gold then was at 1266 spot month, that we thought that was probably a low right there and ready for a turn. Well, we got a $20 turn so far. Mm-hmm. It was $20 off the low of the month. Um, so it, it's not showing any downside in gold that looks sustainable. It looks like drift drift, drift for the last three months. Uh, so the tone isn't that bad. And if you look at the percentage drop that gold's actually suffered from peak tick to low tick over the last four months, mm. 5.8%, only 5.8%. And now we're already a couple percent off that low. So anyway, but watch the uh, dollar, watch uh, the Fed, because I, I suspect if we get a dollar wobble, uh, excuse me, a stock market wobble uh, in next month, from probably at least mm-hmm. uh, twenty nine fifty high in the S and P, that will spook them, and they'll cut rates. Mm-hmm. And that should have repercussions. Uh, yeah, in many markets. Yeah, I think uh, if there's any doubt that uh, that there was that the Fed's watching the mar- watching the uh, the equity markets, I, I think there can't be any doubt about that any longer. There, there's no. Well, it's almost as if it, it's almost as if the uh, they see the equity markets as being the economy almost. Well, it is. It's the last edifice that they created, and it's a huge one. And it looks like a great skyscraper when you look at the S&P price chart going back for the last decade. Mm-hmm. And I argue that uh, it's about two-thirds of that skyscraper is made up of uh, plaster and plywood, not concrete and steel. Yeah, so, that's, uh, that's kind of scary. Well, it. It, it, if it caves, there's trouble. You know, Michael, before we just with a, with a minute and a half or so, two minutes left here yet, you before we went on the air, you talked about the money supply is really dropping very dramatically, and I know recently I saw some statistics showing uh, the velocity of money from the Federal Reserve, the St. Louis Fed, I believe, puts it out, is also dropping very dramatically. 
What do you make of that, and and what does how is that going to play into all of these these other markets? Well, a good friend of mine is Michael Polaro, who used to write for Forbes. Uh, he maintains what's called the Austrian true money supply. He takes Fed data and uh, incorporates uh, factors that in that data that the Austrian School of Economics would do. Is anyway, he plots the true money supply. That, that's the month over month or year over year growth in the money uh, mm-hmm. supply. And uh, we're in a down now. It never it never goes to zero or negative. Yeah. Well, let's put it that way. Money supply always basically every decade almost doubles. All, it's just consistent since the mid 1900s. Uh, so anytime you get a down, it's usually a temporary thing. But we're down, and uh, the, we're, we've got some of the lowest true money supply readings uh, that we've had in a couple of years, and we're down at levels that, uh, that reflect the lack of growth in money supply that occurred prior to the 2000 collapse and prior to the 2008 stock market collapse. Mm-hmm. So if you use it as a broad background indicator, uh, you're right. Um, money growth is, so while it's still positive, it's at the lower end of, of what central bankers would call acceptable. Uh, mm-hmm. and I'm sure uh, Powell is somewhat aware of that, if he, even if he doesn't watch the Austrian metric. Right. He's aware yeah. that money growth is, is slow, and so he'll respond. And, of course... That have consequences. Well, sure, and you know, when you have so much debt on the books, the interest cost of the, just the cost of servicing that debt sucks money out of the economy, and and people have less to spend, uh, and uh, so I'm sure that's part of the equation as well that they have to be worried about, and that's why I think what we see is more and more money being created faster and faster with each of these major uh, bubbles that are created. And it is uh, yep. certainly disconcerting, and um, I don't know if we're ever going to get back to some sort of semblance of free market uh, interest rates. It, it, probably some sort of a cataclysmic event is going to have to happen before people have some sense knocked back into their heads, before all of the intellectuals, uh, the, the Keynesians and all the, the Ph.D. economists at the Fed finally uh, get some wisdom in, those, in their skulls. I but, quite agree. Quite agree. Yeah. I think it's around the corner. <laughs> Well, you know, um, we've got to prepare as best we can, and thank you again, Michael, for helping us do that uh, in keeping track of the, of the markets. You've been remarkably good and, and very, very helpful to me and to my listeners. Thanks for being with us. 